is Morris. You might remember me from such lo-fi lounge features as The Time Machine. Teddy Quinn's been in the show business since he was a lad. Originally from LaPorte, Indiana, he broke out as a child actor in a popular nationally televised Bear Aspirin commercial and later appeared in lots of TV episodes, including one each on Bonanza and Bewitched, as well as on an episode of My Favorite Martian, where he failed to land a zap gun shot on Ray Walston, leading to subsequent comical behavior by Bill Bixby. He formed a band called Telekin as New Wave crashed into Southern California, he worked closely with Fred Drake and Dave Catching at the world-famous recording studio Rancho de la Luna. For many years, Teddy ran the free Monday night open mic reality show at Pappy and Harriet's indoor stage, and at the second annual Camper Cracker in 2006, his band performed both Friday and Saturday sets. He also played sets at the 2009 and 2011 campouts, once with his own band and the other as a one-off group, intended to be billed as TV giants, but appearing on promotional material as Giant TV. Ted and his son Sage are active in the local music scene in the Joshua Tree area, and he's still strongly influenced by David Bowie. Ted made a whole album, 111, named for the day after Bowie died, as a full-on tribute to him. Keeping with the Bowie theme, join me in the time machine as I take you and Chris on a trip backwards. We'll go to campout number two, Saturday, September 9th, 2006, on the indoor stage of Pappy and Harriet's Pioneer Town Palace, as Ted Quinn and friends perform the David Bowie tune, The Gene Genie the first tune written for Bowie's 73 album, Aladdin Sane. Let's go then now. Chris, please push the big button. Until last time.
first rebel rebel chris o'leary you're in from 1965 through 1975 he covers bowie's everything every song every recording every unreleased recording and it captures the fire of that early spirit then he follows up o'leary has uh, from 1976 to the end of bowie's career Again, the same model where you take song by song, unreleased things, and tells the story of these recordings and who the person was during this time. So if you look at both these books, you get a real good feel for a very mysterious person. The third book is the Ultimate Mystery uh, Space Odyssey. This isn't about David Bowie. This is about the making of the movie. It was by Michael Benson and Stanley Kubrick and Arthur C. Clarke and the making of a masterpiece. All three books put together get you a better understanding of this planet. When David Bowie was doing it over there, the caretakers, the caretakers are doing, are doing it, right it right here, here in the I.E. I. 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 In part one, the early years of the Inland Empire band, the Caretakers, were covered. In late 1967, they began opening for some big-name touring rock acts, thanks to the efforts of their manager, Andy Gray. The cover of the January 12, 1968 KFXM Tiger Mag announced a local appearance by the legendary Buffalo Springfield. The Caretakers and their light show opened the concert that took place at the Purple Haze Club in Riverside. February 1968 was a busy month for the Caretakers. On the 3rd, they opened for the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band at the Purple Haze. The next weekend, they returned to the Purple Haze. Friday, February 9th, they opened for late 1960s L.A. band The Knack not to be confused with the late 1970s L.A. band of the same name. And on Saturday, February 10, they headlined Over the Hunger. KFXM's annual March of Dimes dance and show took place on February 17th at the Swing Auditorium in San Bernardino. The caretakers shared the bill with the Seeds, the Count Five, the Merry-Go-Round, the Rivingtons, the Knack, October Country, and others. One of the biggest IE gigs for the Caretakers was opening for the UK band Cream on February 25th at the Swing Auditorium. Tickets for the concert were only $3. The event was presented by KFXM and Caretakers manager Andy Gray. Over 5,000 fans attended the show. The May 3rd KFXM Tiger Mag presented a Caretakers article. Carolyn Jones talked about an April 26, 1968 Purple Haze concert that they performed with the all-female band The Daisy Chain, an IE group, the YB Blues Band. The band members were listed as Bill Fernandez, drums, Jim Kane, rhythm guitar, Don Farrow, bass, Bill Murray, organ, Eric Fields, lead guitar and vocals, and new lead vocalist Bruce Robertson. The article also mentioned the release of the Caretaker's first single, Good Inside. It came out in April 1968 and was written by another IE musician, Steve Horde, lead singer of Rialto's Bush. Good Inside received local airplay, charting as high as number 11, on the KFXM Radio 59 Fabulous 40. The 45 was co-produced by KFXM Advertising Sales Manager Bill Bellman and Band Manager Andy Gray. On Saturday, May 4th, the Caretakers and their light show headlined a concert at the Purple Haze. In June 1968, the Caretakers released their second single, The World Outside, the protest tune was composed by band members Bruce Robertson and Bill Murray. Meanwhile, the band played the Purple Haze Club in Riverside three times in June 1968. On Friday the 14th, they headlined over shredded wheat, 
and the YB Blues Band. On Friday the 28th, they opened again for the Van Morrison Less Them. And on Saturday the 29th, they opened for Rod Piazza's Dirty Blues Band. Another memorable appearance for the Caretakers was on August 28, 1968, when they shared the bill at the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium with The Who and the James Cotton Blues Band. Two days later, they played the Swing Auditorium, second bill to Iron Butterfly. Opening the evening was a group called The End. In the 1960s, radio station KFXM staged a number of rooftop dances concerts on the upper level of a parking structure in downtown Riverside. On October 5, 1968, the caretakers were co-headliners with L.A. band October Country. On the undercard were a number of IE bands. On October 11th, caretakers manager Andy Gray produced a concert at the Swing Auditorium featuring Canned Heat and Country Joe and the Fish. Although not listed in this ad, the opening bands were an IE power trio known as the Bushy Clumps and a band that had yet to release their first album, the Chicago Transit Authority. Although his concert promotions were taking more of his time, Andy Gray remained committed to the caretakers as the band released their third single, East Side Story, in November 1968. It was a cover version of a 1966 single written and performed by Bob Seeger and his band The Last Herd. On the December 4, 1968, came in Heavy Hits chart, East Side Story was listed as Hitbound. On the December 20th, 1968, KFXM Radio 59, Tiger 30, it made the top 10 of the local chart, making it their most popular single in the IE. In December 1968, the caretakers were on a short tour, opening for a version of Buffalo Springfield that only contained one original member. The classic lineup had disbanded in mid-1968. By the middle of 1969, the caretakers decided to take a new direction and reinvented themselves as the band Train. Their first single under this name was a somewhat controversial One Way Street. It told the story of a former member of the band who had descended into drug abuse. It was composed by band members Bruce Robertson and Bill Murray. One of the biggest 1969 shows at the Swing Auditorium was the August 8th concert with Led Zeppelin and Jethro Tull. A battle-worn ticket for that evening reveals that Train was the opening band. On August 15th at the Swing Auditorium, Andy Gray Productions presented Diana Ross and the Supremes. Supporting the headliners were Edwin Starr and the Edwin Hawkins Singers. Not listed in the ad was opening act the Jackson Five. At this time, the Five were an emerging Motown group. After this concert, the trail of the caretakers, Train, and manager Andy Gray grew cold. There were no further releases or mentions of the band and their manager in the local press. Part 3 will offer an opportunity to hear caretakers music that was released on singles. The Sleeping Woman Dreams of Space to David Bowie's long lost soundtrack. A storm of spiders settle in as Major Tom's changing light bulbs on the moon. Perfectly calm, she lies in the trance. The spiders from Mars make webs on her brow. Changes plays on throughout the dream until the woman snores and a new song comes on. On her head, Siggy Stardust plays guitar, her sleep too tight to feel it. She hears the crowd roar 
as each song ends. She walks in twilight and spits in a fool's eye, a pile of dung who made her sad. She grows fond of her spaced out dream. She dreams in color, in black and white dress. There is no sun in her life on Mars. Still there is beauty in her darkest thoughts. She dances by the light of the moon. She resembles a moon peddler, a saleswoman dressed in a long black veil. She's a pretty one when she is dreaming. She's a pretty one when she's awake. Someone calls her Lady Stardust as the dream ends and the lights blind her. a couple of releases I wanted to share with you. The first one is Divine Symmetry box set focuses on Bowie's uh, Hunky Dory album and it has a notebook um, that comes with it. It's a student notebook that has you know lyrics as he was working them out and, and drawings and chord changes and it's it's uh there's a lot of things in here if you're really getting into the um evolution of this particular album and at this particular time for a lot of folks this is when he really finds his voice and makes a a leap forward what's nice about this set is you know there's lots of i mean there's, as these things are there's lots of different uh versions of the songs and you know early demos and mono mixes but the main thing is that you understand that he understands that the music that he's creating is very thought out and very pre-planned and the final versions aren't that different from what the demos are which is unusual for a, a budding artist the second thing I want to share with you a recent purchase if you go go and track this down um it's called brilliant adventures 1995 to 1999 and you could start with this but it's just an empty box because i think they're urging you to buy the cds that go into it but there's this wonderful set of uh tours from the 1990s when he had in sound and vision tour he had you know stopped playing you know most of his hits and was and was depending uh on new material and it's a really te great testament to how uh, a s chance that he took in in investing in his own new music uh which each one of these albums you know features different eras uh of stuff from you know, like earthling tours and hours uh, which really was the beginning of his resurgence as, as an artist. So two pieces, one and him getting going and the next one that carried him all the way home. Oh, oh, oh. 
for a week straight at home in the summer of 1973, I learned and recorded David Bowie's Space Oddity. With my parents on vacation in Arizona, I didn't call teenage friends over. Instead, I sat morning to night to morning with an acoustic guitar, a Concord two-track reel-to-reel, and a Radio Shack microphone, deciphering his chords, strumming at his floating rhythm, and singing most earnestly his soaring double harmony. For here I am, sitting in a tin can. And I was living in a tin can for that week, glued to the singer, wrapped in his song. And I exited a musician, forever touched by the possibilities music would bring. I learned the freedom of words from Bob Dylan, the majesty of melody from John Lennon and Paul McCartney, from David Bowie. I learned the mystery of music, the spirit that says, if you hear a sound, you must chase it with all your heart to the end of your days. Though I'm past 100,000 miles, I'm feeling very still. And I think my spaceship knows which way to go. Tell my wife I love her very much. She knows. Ground control made to time, your circuit's dead. There's something wrong, can you hear me, Major Tom? 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 